All right, now here we're in Leviticus chapter 4. Now Leviticus is a book of the Bible that I think a lot of Christians tend to skip over and don't read probably as often as you should. And you see here in chapter 4, it's very repetitive, right? I mean, he goes on and on, and there's a lot of detail given all throughout Leviticus where it's talking about how they prepare the sacrifices and all the things that they do. It can be very repetitive. But there's a good reason for that, and that's not what this sermon's all about. But, I mean, think about the detail that God's laying out. God wanted it to be done a specific way. He had all of these different sins, all these different types of offerings, sin offerings, peace offerings. He wanted them done His way specifically. They're not in there just for no reason. I mean, He's not just, just, being, he's not just trying to be boring, right? I mean, God said, no, this is how you do it. This is exactly how you do it. When you have this sin, this is the way it's played out. So, but what we need to be careful of is because it is because God is very specific and because it tends to be repetitive, don't let your mind just get glossed over, right? When you're doing your Bible reading and you say, you know what, I have to read the book of Leviticus, so I'm just going to read it because, you know, you're trying to obey God's commandment. You're trying to, you know, read his word and do what you're supposed to do. Try to be conscious when, when you get to these, these aspects because it's also in like Exodus when it talks about the tabernacle. There is good truths to be learned in these areas that are seemingly boring. It might take a little while, but, but try not to let yourself just, just gloss over and, just, and just, just read through it without thinking about it. Now, again, that's not what the sermon's about this morning, but I wanted to point that out because we read the entire chapter. And as we're going through it, you know it's just repetitive, repetitive. It's okay, well, what's going on here? What, we're, what I'm preaching on this morning is sinning through ignorance. And that's what this whole chapter is dedicated to. This is how we respond to, to you know, what kind of type of sacrifices are required to atone when people sin through ignorance. Now, look if you would real quick. We're going we're gonna to see in, um, I'm just going to kind of recap some of the verses we already read. So in verse 3, it says, If the priest that is anointed do sin according to the sin of the people... Then let him bring for his sin, and it goes on and on about, about what he needs to bring. It lists off the priest. In verse number 13, it says, And if the whole congregation of Israel sin through ignorance. So it starts at the priest, then it says if the whole church, basically the whole congregation of Israel, sin through ignorance, then it gives them, again, the sacrifice that they need to offer. Verse um, 22, it says, When a ruler hath sinned and done somewhat through ignorance. And then it gives, it gives that... Um, sacrifice that needs to be made. And then in verse 27, it says, and if any one of the common people sin through ignorance. So it's basically listing off everybody, right? I mean, it's saying, if you're a priest, if you're a church member, if you're a ruler, or if you're just a com one of the common folk, right? Maybe you don't go to church, whatever. If you sin through ignorance, there is an atonement that needs to be made. Now, in the Old Testament, they did these sacrifices, right? We know that this... These atonements, these sacrifices, were not for their eternal salvation. Okay, there's a big difference there. When they would do these sacrifices, this did not, you know, clear their conscience. The Hebrews makes that abundantly clear that the blood of bulls and of goats can, you know, can no way um, satisfy their sin. Basically, that's that, I'm paraphrasing, but um, that there's no way that that can atone for their sins in the eternal sense, right? People have always been saved by grace through faith. But what this is, this is like getting right with God, okay? This is the way that they would get right with God, and they say, you know what, I sinned, and I'm going to get right with God, so he had these sacrifices that they had to do in order to get right with them. So today, what we do is, you need to confess your sin to God and forsake that sin, right? We don't have these offerings to offer anymore because they were also a picture of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ came and he was the, you know, the, the, the offering. He was the Lamb of God. He offered up himself so that these, these things were done away from the Levitical priesthood. But it doesn't change the fact that we still need to get right with God. Now, do we have to get right with God to be saved forever? You know, after you're already saved, you have to, you know, when you sin? No. But we still ought to get right with God so that we have a good standing and relationship with him um, when we sin. Now, what's important to note here is just that, you know, it doesn't matter who you are. Because, I mean, list off all these different types of people. It doesn't matter who you are. There's no special rules for any one person as far as sinning through ignorance. If you sin through ignorance, 
It's still a sin. Now, what's ignorance? Ignorance is just you didn't know something, right? So you commit a sin you didn't know was a sin. You're, you're ignorant of it. You're not learned of that. You didn't, you didn't know that. So if you're, let's say you have a brand new Christian, right? Someone, they just put their faith in Christ. They don't know the Bible that well at all, right? Like they just got saved. Maybe they hadn't been brought up with the Bible, right? So they don't know what the Bible says. They don't know all the laws of God. Right? Because they haven't read it yet. They haven't been told it yet. They haven't been taught it. They haven't, they haven't seen it for themselves. Does that make... Let's just say they didn't know that, that going out and getting drunk was a sin. They didn't know that. Because they didn't see it in the Bible. They, didn't, they had no idea. Now, if they go out and get drunk, is that still a sin? Absolutely. God's laws don't change. So it doesn't matter if you don't know something's a sin... It still is. And the Bible's even saying here that there's a sacrifice that needed to be made even if it was through ignorance. And you know what that sacrifice was? It says in verse 20, it says, And he shall do with the bullock as he did with the bullock for a sin offering. It's the same thing as the offering for a sin offering was this, you know, was sinning through ignorance because it's still a sin. You're still held responsible. It still falls on you that you've sinned through ignorance. Um... God doesn't want us to, you know, he wants us to know the Bible. And if he's going to hold us responsible for our sins, if he's going to hold us responsible for sinning through ignorance, then we better make sure that we know his word, right? Because you don't want to sin through ignorance because you're just as guilty as if you knew it, as if you didn't. You know, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's still something that you're guilty of. Now he's saying here, look, when it comes to your mind, when you know it, when you see it, when it's been given to you and you say, okay, look, now I know this is a sin, that's when you when you get right with God. That's when you bring the sacrifice, and that's when you when you come and, and confess that sin and, and be done with it, you know, and get and get past it. Now, there's a lot of people, one of the reasons why I'm preaching this is there's a lot of people that are out there, they think that things are only a sin if you're convicted of the Holy Ghost. They'll say things like, oh, well, if the Holy Spirit's moving on you that you know drinking alcohol is wrong then yeah, it's wrong for you. But the Holy Spirit hasn't told me that it's wrong. And they, they, they rely on this feeling or emotion or whatever it is that they think that, you know, this feeling of conviction about sin. And I'll tell you what, that is just completely unscriptural. The Bible doesn't say anywhere just that if you, um, if you just feel convicted, then that's what makes things right and wrong. Now, the Bible does say this, that if you think something is a sin and you do it anyways, that is a sin. Even if you were incorrect on what you thought was a sin. So like, I mean, they have a good example here. If I thought that it was a sin to, um, eat mashed potatoes. Yeah, exactly, okay. That's a, that's a great example, because that's what it uses in the Bible, right? Eat, if I thought it was a sin to eat pork, right? Because that was an Old Testament restriction. If I thought it was a sin today, in 2014, to eat pork, then if I were to eat pork with that, with that understanding, with, with me thinking that it's a sin, then that is a sin. That would be a sin for me. But eating pork is not a sin, right? It's, it's, not, it's no longer one of the dietary restrictions that we have. There's nothing wrong with it going to eat it. But if I think that it's a sin and I just do it anyways, that is a sin, right? But this nonsense of people saying, well, if the Holy Ghost is convicting you about it, then that's, that's basically what you need to follow. That's kind of a, a perversion of what the Bible's saying there about if you think something's a sin and you do it, it's a sin. Because here's the thing, they'll say, they'll just use that to justify their own sin. They'll say, oh, well, the Holy Spirit's not telling me that drinking's wrong, so I'm going to keep on doing it. Which is nonsense because... God has one law for everybody. It's the same. The rules don't change. He doesn't say, oh, well, I'm going to tell this person that this is wrong, but I'm not going to tell this person that it's wrong. It does, that God doesn't do that. Okay? And it's not God. If, you, if I were to think that eating pork is wrong today, that's not God telling me that. That's not the Holy Spirit saying, hey, you shouldn't eat pork. That's not God because God said that it's perfectly okay in his word. So you might have some feeling, you might have some emotion, you might have some thoughts on your own, right? 
And you might think it's based on scripture. Hey, whatever. If you think that way, then just make sure you don't do it. <laughs> because otherwise it would be a sin because then you're going to be sinning against your conscience, against what you believe is God's law. And, that, and God does hold that as a sin. But, um, you know, sinning through ignorance is something that we've got to make sure that we steer clear of. Look at Leviticus chapter 5. Because it continues on with the, with the sinning through ignorance here in Leviticus 5. Verse number 2 says, Or if a soul shall touch any unclean thing, whether it be a carcass of an unclean beast, or a carcass of unclean cattle, or the carcass of unclean creeping things, and if it be hidden from him, he also shall be unclean and guilty. So it says, like, if you didn't know it, like, like if you came into contact, because they had unclean beasts, or, you know, beasts that die of themselves, right? The Bible is very clear saying that, you know, if you were to handle an unclean beast, you know, a, some, a, a beast that died or whatever, you would be unclean until the evening. Like, the God considers you unclean. You have to wash. You're unclean until the evening. And what he's saying here is that if, you, if it's hidden from you, if you've come into contact with that, but you didn't even realize it, you didn't know it, he says, well, you're still unclean and guilty. It doesn't matter whether or not you had the knowledge of it. It doesn't matter if you were ignorant of it. If you did it, you did it. Again, it's the same law. And it says in verse 3, it says, Or if he touch the uncleanness of man, whatsoever uncleanness it be, that a man shall be defiled withal, and it be hid from him. When he knoweth of it, then he shall be guilty. And Or if a soul swear, pronouncing with his lips to do evil or to do good, whatsoever it be, that a man shall pronounce with an oath, and it be hid from him. When he knoweth of it, then he shall be guilty in one of these. And it shall be, when he shall be guilty in one of these things, that he shall confess that he hath sinned in that thing, and he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord. So, what he's saying here is that, look, it doesn't matter if you've been hit. Again, I'm going to, you know, we're kind of beating a dead horse here a little bit, but if you sin, if you do something that you're not supposed to do, and you don't even realize that it's wrong, you didn't know it, or you, you accidentally did something you didn't know it, you're still held accountable, and what we ought to do is confess that you've sinned. And see, this is a big problem that people have today, and it's a heart problem, it's an attitude problem. When you realize that you've done something wrong, because you've seen it from the scripture, this is going to define you as a Christian and in your Christian life. This is going to be a big, a big moment in your life whenever you're confronted with your sin. Because you can go down one of two paths. When you learn about a sin that you've done, it may be hard because you might have thought there was nothing wrong with it. You might have thought that you were doing just fine. So in your mind, you're justified and everything is great. When you get confronted and say, no, actually what you did is a sin, it's wrong, you shouldn't have done that, there's two reactions you can have. You can have the humble attitude where you see God's word and you say, yes, I sinned. And you can confess your sin to God and just forsake it and move past it. And God will forgive you. Or you can have the attitude that just says, I, no, I didn't do anything wrong. And just have that stiff neck. Have that rebellious type of heart. And I'll tell you what, if you do that, God is not going to be pleased with you. And you will be held responsible for that sin. And again, I'm not going to bring this up again, but I just want to, I want to get it settled out of the way. When I'm talking about sins and the forgiveness of sins, we're not talking about your eternal salvation. We're talking about God's chastising and punishment and his mercy that he can have with you in this lifetime. Okay? How the level, the, the extent to you, the amount you reap what you're sowing and what you're doing is going to be dependent a lot, a lot of times on how you respond when you understand that you've sinned, okay? God will extend more mercy unto you when he sees that you have a contrite heart, when he sees that you're humble, when he sees that you just accept and you can see, you know, you're honestly trying to do what's right. You've sinned through ignorance. You're still guilty of that. But he will extend mercy unto you when you have the right attitude and when you confess it and just say, okay, I've sinned. And in verse 17 of chapter 5, it says, And if a soul sin and commit any of these things which are forbidden to be done by the commandments of the Lord, though he wist it not, yet is he guilty and shall bear his iniquity. So it doesn't matter what it is. 
Um, God expects us to know his laws. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 19, please. Turn to Psalm 19. God expects us to know his laws. Otherwise, he wouldn't hold us accountable for ignorant sins. And, and the thing is, if God didn't hold us accountable for ignorant sins, then the best solution would be, hey, let's nobody read the Bible, because if God's not going to hold us accountable, then I don't want to know any of them, right? Because, I mean, we're sinners. And you think that, like, if you got a free pass from sin because you just didn't know it, and this is the argument that people will use. I was talking to a, to a Mormon guy there, I was trying to get him saved, and he, he, he uh, brought up, which you, you'll get this from time to time out so and say, well, what if there's a guy that's in the jungle somewhere, never heard of Jesus Christ, you know, what happens to that person when they die? And I say, well, if they don't put their faith in Jesus Christ, they're going to go to hell. Because we're all sinners. And this is part of the reason that, look, if you sin through ignorance... Just because they didn't, they may not have known that what they were doing is wrong. We're all sinners. Every single one of us. God's law is the same for everybody. It's the same for a person that's out in the jungle as it is for us here today in the city. His laws don't change. They're the same. They're applied to everybody. There is the same punishment for our sins. And that's why that nobody gets a free pass. Jesus Christ said, I am the way. The truth and the life. He said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. No man. You have to go through Jesus Christ. It has to come through faith. And I explained to him, I said, look, the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if nobody preaches the gospel to that person, they can't believe on Jesus Christ because they can't have faith in him because the faith comes by hearing. That's what the scripture says, which is why it's so extremely important and the burden is on us to preach the gospel to every creature. Because not everybody, look, if that, and, and that would be horrible, right? For a person to not even hear about Jesus Christ, not even know that, that they can just be saved by grace. And for that person to die and go to hell, you say, well, they never had a chance. Well, that's because you didn't go out and give them that chance. That God has given us, he's committed unto us the ministry of reconciliation. Again, I will, I will beat this down into our heads Every single week to understand the importance of going out and soul winning because there's people that are dying every single day, every single second, every single minute of the day. There are people who are losing their life and many of them are dying and going to hell. And there are very few people that are out there and explaining how easy it is to be saved just by putting your faith through Christ. It is our job to do that. Nobody else is going to. God is not going to give that person a special chance after they die and they're confronted with God and say, oh, well, now do you want to believe on Christ? He's not going to do that. That's not the way he set it up. And if they say, well, no one's told me. Shame on you, Christian, for not telling them. That is our job. And that's how serious it is. That's why it's, it's, this isn't a game. I mean, we're not just, I'm not just doing it to like, you know, put numbers in, the, in, in here and just to talk about it and have something to talk about. I mean, this, is, this has a real impact on people's eternal salvation, on their lives. It's the most important event that happens to any one person in their life. It's by far the most important thing. Your personal salvation. It's our job to preach the gospel so that people can at least have the opportunity to get saved. And God forbid that anybody should die and go to hell that has never had that opportunity. It should be our focus, our, our primary goal and function is to preach the gospel to other people to help them get saved. That is what we need to do because we see here, if you sin through ignorance, you're still held accountable for it. The people that don't know about Jesus Christ, they're still going to be held accountable for their sins. They're still sins. They've still broken the law. Now, are you in Psalm 19? Psalm 19, let's start reading in verse number 7. The Bible says, The law of the Lord is perfect. So don't get mad at the law, right? Don't think like, oh, well, if the law wasn't there, then we wouldn't be sinners. The law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul, even, the Bible says. You know, the law is our schoolmaster that brings us to Christ. The law is there to help us even understand, hey, you're sinners. You're wicked. Don't get mad at the preacher, therefore, that preaches on sin. 
The law is perfect converting the soul. The, 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 the preacher that preaches on sin and preaches the law is trying to help you and trying to teach you the perfect law of God. Let's continue reading. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Learning God's law is going to make you smart. It's going to make you wise. Verse number 8, the statutes of the law are right, rejoicing the heart. It's not something that should bring you down. It's a rejoice to the heart to learn God's laws. It's something that's going to give you wisdom. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Again, I mean, look at our video. I love, I love the language that's used here. It's so colorful. It's so beautiful and magnificent. And he's saying the same things over and over again. The law, the testimony, the statutes, the commandments, they enlighten the eyes. They give you wisdom. They rejoice the heart. Verse number nine, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold. Yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned. And in keeping of them, there is great reward. So we are to be warned by God's laws, by his statutes, by his testimonies. That's something that's a warning for us. And it says in keeping them, there's great reward. So if you follow God's laws, if you're doing what's right, hey, there's a great reward in that. That's a positive thing. You're going to be blessed with that. Verse 12, who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. So he said, look, who could even know all of their sins? And this is why it's so ridiculous. I mean, you get these people that say, oh, well, I've repented of my sins. You probably don't even know what all of your sins are. You probably don't even have a clue that some of the things that you're doing are even a sin. You might not even realize that. We're so brainwashed in this culture today, and there's so many outside influences from the devil that have gotten into our head that you might not even realize that you're sinning against God's law. And even David, a man after God's own heart, is saying, look, who can know their sins? And that's why I said, cleanse thou me from secret faults. And secret meaning he doesn't even know them. His faults, his sins that he's not even aware of, he's asking God, God, cleanse me from my secret faults. Verse 13, keep back thy servants also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Now, this is the attitude that we all ought to have. This is a great attitude to have. Exalting God's law, exalting his word, putting it up and saying, look, they're joyful. It's, it's going to give us wisdom. It's something that we shouldn't bristle at. It's something that we shouldn't stiff our neck to or not want to hear. We should want to learn more of it. We should want to study it, meditate on it. It's good for you. It's going to be good for your life. And it's a warning for us. So when the pastor's preaching on sin, hey, look, it's a warning. You know, I've said this before. Look, the preacher that, that, that preaches the hardest on sin is the one that loves you the most. Because they don't want you going out and getting involved in this stuff. They understand, hey, look, this is wickedness. God's not going to be happy with it. Now, people don't realize it sometimes because they don't understand how God's working in their life. They can't see it. It's something that, that, that is, has to be taken on faith many times or you don't understand the way things are going in your life. But we have God's word that gives us the truth and that, and that will help you. Look, receive these warnings. Because God's not mocked and he's going to hold you accountable for these, for these ignorant sins that you might do. Unfortunately now, we live in a day where many Christians are sinning ignorantly on a daily basis. It just happens all the time. And I'm going to bring up now some of the most common cases. Now, there are varying degrees of how bad they are. Some are worse, some are not. But it doesn't matter if there's a sin, it's a sin. And we ought not to, whether you think it's a small sin or whether you think it's a big sin, whatever it may be, you ought, you ought to be trying as hard as you can to get that sin out of your life and recognize that it is a sin. Now, um, you don't have to turn, all, turn if you would, to uh, Leviticus 19, because there's a, there's a few that were going in there. Um, but the first thing, and then these are in no particular order. I was just trying to think of stuff that are real common that people don't even realize is a sin. The first one I'll point out is tithes. Now, 
I'm not someone who's focused on money. Money means nothing. I don't care. But I'll tell you what, the Bible says that if you don't tithe, that it's a sin. Okay? Plain and simple. Now, I'm going to preach the truth. I'm going to preach all of God's word. You know, I'm not up here trying to, to, you know, preach for filthy lucre's sake. Right? I don't care. Look, if you don't tithe, that's between you and God. It's not going to hurt my feelings any. It doesn't matter to me. But I'm going to preach the Bible. The Bible says in Malachi 3.8, it says, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me, but ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. You see, the tithe, the tithe belongs to God. That's his money. He, he, he gets the tenth of, of, of your increase. He gets the tenth. That's God's money. When you don't give it to God, he says, you're robbing me. You're stealing from me. That's one sin. A lot of people don't understand that. They think it's optional. They think that, you know, it's just, you know, there's, there's, there's two things. There's tithes and there's offerings. Offerings are something that you give free will. That's something that you just, out of, out of the goodness of your heart, you just, you want to you be a blessing or whatever. You give offerings. Amen. The tithe is something, though, that's God's. That's something that's a requirement for us. That's something we ought to be following. Okay? And a lot of people sin through ignorance because they don't understand. They haven't seen the scriptures. They don't know that, yes, God expects you to tithe. Okay? Another thing. You're in Leviticus 19. Look at verse number 28. The Bible says, Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. Printing marks upon you, that's getting tattoos. Okay? The Bible says, look, don't print any marks upon you. In plain English. Okay? A lot of people these days, they don't understand the Bible. They haven't read Leviticus. I mean, most your average Christian never even read Leviticus. They don't know. It's boring. They don't want to read Leviticus. Oh, that's that old law stuff. That was for the old time. That was the Old Testament stuff. We don't need that stuff today. Hogwash. We do. This is, I mean, this is still in effect. I believe God hasn't changed on, on all these, um, you know, these moral laws, the things that were not specifically done away with. Hey, God still feels the same way about it. People get a lot, and, and a lot of Christians get tattoos, and they'll get like Bible verses and stuff. And they'll think that they're doing right by God. They'll think that they're going to be pleasing to God when it's actually the exact opposite. It's contrary because the Bible says right here not to print any marks upon you. Just don't do it. Again, how are you going to receive this? Right? As we go through this, we have, look, people are going to be guilty of different things. Right? Not every, you know, some people have tattoos, some people don't tithe, and as we go through this, there's going to be other things. Maybe, maybe it affects you, maybe it doesn't. You know, whatever. It doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is, if it's in God's word, how are you going to receive it? The next thing, look at, look at verse 31, Leviticus 19. It says, Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. And I preached on this last week a little bit, but, you know, witchcraft, psychics, going to the astrologers, doing all this stuff. Hey, the Bible says, regard not them. Don't go to them. Don't participate in that. It's wickedness. It's sin. You ought not to be doing it. Hey, if you're a Christian, Leviticus 19.31, and in many other places in the Old Testament, explain, do not go to them with familiar spirits. Don't do the Ouija boards. Don't do the, the, the psychics. Don't do it. I don't care if you say, oh, well, it's just for fun. We're just going to go out and have a laugh and have a good time. The Bible says not to do it. Don't be defiled with them. It's defiling. Don't do it. Okay? How about, look at verse number 32. After verse 31, it says, Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head. Hoary means like white, right? A gray, white head. And honor the face of the old man and fear thy God. I am the Lord. Now, a lot of people don't realize, look, thou shalt. Does that sound like a commandment? Sounds like a commandment to me, right? A lot of people don't do it. They, they used to, the people think that it's just, it's just a tradition, right? It's just because, you know, back in the, in the 40s or 50s, you know, people actually used to have manners and respect, and, and, and this was taught in the household and the families of, of how you treat other people, which is completely done away in today's society. Now it's like you have kids just, just talking to adults as if they're just buddies and friends and just not giving them respect and everything else. But the Bible says here that you need to rise up. You stand up. If someone comes in that's an older man, they have a white head, and says, hey, look, you stand up. 
You give respect unto that person, honor the face of the old man, and fear, the, and fear God. A lot of people don't do that. Hey, you're sinning. Now, the Bible says that it's in Leviticus 19.32 that we need to be doing that. Okay? And if we don't do that, and I'm sure I've been guilty of this too. But look, now you know it. No longer can you say, I didn't even know that, which isn't a valid excuse in the first place. But now, how are you going to respond? How do you respond when you hear God's word? Are you going to take it and say, you know what? This is what the Bible says. I've sinned. I haven't done what I was supposed to do. Or are you just going to stiff your neck and say, you know what? No, no, I don't care about that. I don't, I don't care if some, some older man, I'm not going to rise. I'm not going to stand up for him. Why should I show him respect? Well, the Bible says to do it and to fear God. Because God's the one that's going to hold you responsible for that. How about um, Deuteronomy, verse 5? This is my, uh, oh, it's not my last example. i got a few more. And these are just, I'm just trying to come up with the, with the most common things I can think of that are probably being done through ignorance today. Okay? Deuteronomy 22, verse 5 says, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. What is this talking about? It's all about cross-dressing. Right? It's saying, look, if a man wears that which pertains to a woman, or a woman wears that which pertains to a man, you know, it's an abomination. Now, a lot of people read that and say, oh, well, yeah, okay, yeah, cross-dressing is wrong. And they're thinking like, a man dressing up in a dress and putting on a wig and stuff. Hey, that is sin. That is an abomination. That's, that's, that's disgusting. It's perverted. And I don't care if it's October 31st or any other day of the week. The Bible says not to do it, and it's wickedness, and it's sin. I don't care if you're doing it for a joke. The Bible says not to do it. It says an abomination. God doesn't think that's funny. You ought not to do it. Now, here's the thing, and this is where a lot of people, I think, are sitting in through ignorance. It's not just in the Halloween aspect. It's not just in the costume aspect. But what about this? Okay, who determines what's men's clothing, what's women's clothing? Are we going to rely on the world to tell you that? Because I'll tell you what, the world changes. The clothing that's considered women's clothing today is not the same as it was even just 50 or 60 years ago. Amen. Not at all. Not even close. The, the clothing that women wear today that, that people say, oh, that's women's clothing, is the attire of a harlot in many cases. The short showing your nakedness, you know, the immodesty. Just not very long ago in this country, people would look at, a, at, at if, if someone were to take a time machine, right, and warp people from, from 50, 60, 70 years ago into today's culture, they'd be looking around and be like, it's just full of harlots and whores. Because they'll look at the people, at the, at the women, how they're dressed today. Um, do you think God's opinion changes with the way the world changes? Do you think if the world starts saying, oh, well, now it's okay for women to wear this. Now it's okay for men to wear that. I mean, if, 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 if society today just said, there's no reason why a man can't wear a dress. There's no reason for it. I mean, why, why not? Do you think God's going to say, okay, well, but, but no, but they make a men's dresses, Right? <laughs> So they, they, they cut it out, and they make it more designed for a man. So they say, well, no, this is a man's dress, and that's a woman's dress. Do you think God's going to look at it and say, oh, okay. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's fine. In your culture, it's okay for a man to wear a man's dress because it's in the men's section, and the women wear, no. That's nonsense. No, you're, you're fooling yourself if you think that's the way. But then why do you think it's okay for the women to go put on a pair of pants? Just because it's in the women's section. Think about it now. Where are you going to get your? Where are you going to draw the line and say what are men's clothing and what's women's clothing? Many of you may not realize this, but do you know? And I saw this when this this, this pervert died not till a few years ago, and I read this article. This sodomite fashion designer is known for putting women in pants. That's his claim to fame. He did this back, you know, 40 years ago or 50 years ago, or however long ago it was. Well, I, I mean, I don't know, it's probably 60 years ago, so whatever, whatever it was when it started getting popular for women to wear pants, it was a sodomite, God-hating, reprobate fashion designer whose claim to fame was he put women in pants. Does that sound like it's godly? Now look, the Bible says that 
the man should not wear that pertaining to a woman, and a woman should not wear that pertaining to a man. That's what the Bible says. Look, if you want to argue and fight about, well, I still I think it's okay for women to wear pants. I think it's okay to dress like that. Are you going to receive God's word? I mean, the thing about it, logically, is think about it. What what is a man's clothing? What's a woman's clothing? Where do you get your standard from? I mean, to me, it's not that difficult. You have universal symbols on the bathroom doors. Everybody understands that. It doesn't matter what language you speak. The men's restroom, it has a man, and you can see both of their legs and arms and head. And guess what? On the woman's, you see the little triangle thing or whatever that's kind of showing that they're wearing a dress. It's universal. It's understood. It's accepted. People get that. That is the differentiation. I mean, you show, hey, there's a man wearing pants and there's a woman wearing a dress. Or a skirt, whatever. I mean, it's, 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 it's not complicated. Yet people are stiff-necked today and they say, no, I want to do it this way and it's not wrong. Well, that's going to be between you and God, but you can't say that you're ignorant of it now. Let's continue on. I'll get off that point. Proverbs 24.9 says, the thought of foolishness is sin, and the scorner is an abomination to men. The thought of foolishness. You think about something that would be foolish to do or whatever, just thinking it, just in your head. The Bible says that's a sin. Now, that is a harder one probably to deal with. The thoughts that go through your head trying to control and maintain what you're thinking about. This is, this is, a, this is a harder thing to even... I mean, look... The dressing thing, that's an easy fix. <laughs> it doesn't require very much effort to, to put on clothing. And honestly, like, like, I'm pointing it out, like, that's, to me, that's not, I mean, the Bible says an abomination, so it's a big deal, okay? But it's so easy to take care of, and it's, it's kind of like, who cares? Do you really care that much? Are you really going to be ingrained, like, no, I want to wear my pants, or whatever, or, or a man saying, no, I want to wear a skirt. Like, it's ridiculous. Just dress like a man. Dress like a woman and be done with it. A lot of these things are real easy to take care of. But how is your heart? How is your attitude? Do you have a heart that just says, you know what, I just want to make sure that I'm serving God and that even if there's a question about something, you know, I'm not quite sure, you know what, I'm just going to err on the side of caution. Because why do you want to be found guilty of something? If you say, well, you make a good point, but I don't know, I still kind of think that's okay. Look, why, why even, why mess with it? I don't know, that's kind of the way that I approach the Bible. If I look at something, like, you know what, I don't really know. I don't know if this is a sin or not. Just do without it. So what? Like, what's the, what's the big deal? But thinking a foolish thought, that's something you have to get a hold of in your mind and, and try to control the thoughts that you have. And the more you get in the Bible, the more you're thinking about heavenly things, hey, you're not going to be thinking foolish thoughts. Um, that's one way to help you with that. The Bible says even not doing good. In James 4, 17, the Bible says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. If you know you're supposed to be doing something, excuse me, and you don't do it, now this is, this is different because it's not saying, you're not breaking the commandments in the sense that you're breaking like a, a negative command, one that says thou shalt not, right? You're not breaking one of the thou shalt nots. But what you're doing instead, I mean, you might be following all the thou shalt nots. But when it says, if you know to do good and you don't do it, if you get a perfect opportunity to preach the gospel to somebody, you're low, with them, hey, the opportunity presents itself, you know that you should be doing the, you should be doing that, you should be talking to them, you should be witnessing to them, but then you don't do it, the Bible says, hey, to you, that's sin. It's a sin to do that. And again, a lot of people don't realize that these things are sin. I'm just trying to come up with the most common ones. Um, the last place, what, uh, not the last one, the second to last one, 1 Corinthians 11. Turn, if you would, please, to Hebrews chapter number 10. Hebrews chapter number 10 is going to be the last place that, uh, that I have you turn. But in 1 Corinthians 11, well, maybe not the last one. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to make this a two-parter. 1 Corinthians 11 says, Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. So he's saying, look, if a man is praying or prophesying, his head is covered, 
He's dishonoring his head, and he, in the context, is talking about Jesus Christ. But every woman that prays the prophecy with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. Verse 14 says, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. So the coverings that we read about, verse 4 and 5, the Bible defines later on in verse 15 as your hair. Basically, the Bible says, look, if you're a man, you're praying and prophesying, and you have long hair, that dishonors God. He's saying the men should not have long hair. It says, but a woman praying or prophesying with her head uncovered, short hair, shaven, whatever, he said, that dishonors God. That's why he says, doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it's a shame on him. It's a shame for a man to have long hair. But for a woman to have long hair, it's a glory. Again, a lot of people don't realize this. First Corinthians chapter 11 is, is, at least half that chapter is dedicated to this subject. So go ahead and check it out for yourself sometime. It's not something that, you know, about you, a lot of people say, this, oh, well, God doesn't care how I dress. God doesn't care what, how I wear my hair. God doesn't care all these things. Well, the Bible says he does. I mean, you can sit there, you can't claim ignorance anymore after, after seeing these scriptures and, and, and hearing them. It's up to you what you decide to do. Now, the preacher's job is to preach God's word so that you can identify your sins and that you can correct the problem. That's the whole point. The Bible says in Isaiah 58, 1, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. That was, uh, that was Isaiah's job. That's the preacher's job. Look, the preacher's job is to cry aloud, spare not. Don't hold back. I'm not going to hold back God's word from you because I think you might get offended. I'm not going to hold back God's word from you because you might not be able to handle it. That's not my responsibility. I'm going to preach all of God's words. I don't want anybody sinning through ignorance. I want you to understand what it says. And look, Whatever you do with that, that's between you and God. But I don't want to see anyone. I want to help people. I want to show them, hey, this is what God's word says. This is the truth. You're in Hebrews chapter number 10. Look at verse number 25. This is the last, that last aspect that I think people don't understand is a sin. And they sin through ignorance. Verse number 25 says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. He's talking about forsaking the assembling, forsaking church, not going to church. The Bible says that that's a sin. He says the man, that's, that's some people's matter. Some people don't go to church. Some people forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Hebrews 10.25 is saying, don't do that. And in fact, as you see the day approaching, the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, you should be in even more. So much the more you should be in church. So much the more you need to be around God's people. So much the more you need to learn and be edified and be strengthened and go to church. You need it even more as we get farther and farther into this wicked, perverse generation. Don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Now, so far, we've been dealing with sinning through ignorance. That's what I've been trying to expose. Okay, a lot of people commit all these different sins because they don't know it. They don't realize, hey, the Bible actually talks about that. Hey, the Bible says that's a sin. Hey, the Bible says you shouldn't be doing that. You're still held accountable for them. I'm trying to expose some of these things so that you understand, no, these really are sins and you can get right with God. And you can confess and forsake them to God. But the Bible also talks about willful sinning, willfully sinning against the Lord. That's different. Sinning through ignorance is one thing. It says, I didn't know. Sorry, God, I didn't know that was a sin. I'm going to change. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to do that anymore. That's one thing. Knowing God's commandments, knowing that something is wrong, and then just doing it anyways, that's a whole other thing. Look at where you're in Hebrews chapter 10. Look at verse 26. Because just he follows up. Verse 25 talks about not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. Right? He's talking about not going to church. Verse 26 says, For... Because of, and I mean, it's followed up. For is, is joining the two statements, right? For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. All those sacrifices in the Old Testament, those aren't there anymore. We don't have those sacrifices for sins. Verse 27, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy 
who hath trodden under foot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite under the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So he's saying, basically, look, when you willfully sin against God, there's no more sacrifice. We're not in the Old Testament. We don't have these sins where you can come and offer up a bullock or offer up a lamb, and, and that's your sacrifice, and that will help atone for your sins. You don't have that anymore. He said, what you're doing is you're trotting underfoot the Son of God. Jesus Christ came, and he paid for all of your sins. He paid the punishment for your sins. Now you're going to go and have this attitude and say, I know the Bible says that, but I'm going to do it anyways. You're, what are you doing to Jesus Christ? He came and bled and died and suffered for your sins. Now you're going to go out and do something just because of your flesh, because you think it's going to feel good, because you want to just harden your neck against God? So you're doing despite under the spirit of grace. God did all this for you. How angry do you think he's going to be? Look, he did all this hard work to pay for your sins. How unappreciative is it of you Say, I know that Jesus Christ did that. He bled, he suffered, he died, he went through all kinds of heartaches and hardships. He burned in hell for three days and three nights before rising again from the dead. But I just want to do this sin. You do despite unto the spirit of grace. The Bible says that, for we know him that says, said, vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. His people is going to judge. Okay? You have that attitude. You have the vengeance of God on you. Now look, he's not going to cast you out. A lot of people confuse us and say, oh look, this is how a person could lose their salvation. No. God's going to judge his people. It doesn't mean he's going to cast them into hell. But God can bring all kinds of hurt on you in this, in this lifetime. And when you start having that rebellious attitude, that attitude that just says, I don't care, you're saved, right? I mean, hey, the Son of God, grace abounds. Where sin is about it, grace is much more about it. You're still saved. But the Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You don't want to take that kind of attitude towards God. This is, that's where things get serious. Now, I think about this. Think about my, my children, because we're children of God, right? And God deals with us as children. And my children, if I have to tell them, look, I don't want you to do thus and so, right? And they just go and do it anyway. Like right after it comes out, I'll say, you know what? I don't want you to watch a video. They pick it up, they look at me, put it in the DVD player, turn it on. What kind of reaction do you think I'm going to have as a father? You think I'm just going to say, oh, well, that's okay. Now, are they still my, my daughters? Of course they are. But you better believe that they're going to be getting a fiery indignation type of discipline if they look at me and just say, you know what, I'm just going to do what I want to do. Okay? Now, if I catch them doing something that maybe I didn't tell them about, right? So, I mean, that would fall on me. Now, God's already told us his laws. We don't have that excuse of God didn't tell me. It's, it's all right here. But maybe I don't tell them something, so, so maybe they sin through ignorance. Maybe they'll get punishment. Maybe they'll probably just get a lot of mercy, and I'll say, okay, well, yeah, I didn't tell you about that. Or maybe they did something, and they didn't realize what I said. Hey, I don't want you to do this. They do something similar. They don't realize that, that it applies to everything, you know. Um, okay, you know, they still may get punished for it depending on what they did, but um, they'll get a lot more mercy than if they just say, you know what, you just told me not to do it, and I'm, and I'm just going to do it anyways. God deals with us the same way, okay? It's a lack of respect. It's not showing a proper fear of God. Um, the Bible says that, the, that the, the sin of witchcraft in 1 Samuel 15 says, or for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. You do not want to have a rebellious heart. You need to have a humble heart. You need to be able to receive God's word. When you understand, when it comes to your mind, when you see you've sinned through ignorance, don't have this stubborn, rebellious attitude. And then after you know about it, don't go out and just, and just, and just have this attitude where you're just going to do things anyways. Get right with God. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 9, 7, it says, um, 
Remember and forget not how thou provokest the Lord thy God to wrath in the wilderness. Okay. God was provoked to wrath in the wilderness. His, this is talking about when the children of Israel were led out of Egypt and they were wandering about in the wilderness, right? They provoked God. This was God's people. God's chosen people had taken out of Egypt, right? But they provoked God to wrath. It says, from the day that thou didst appear, or depart out of the land of Egypt until you came unto this place, ye have been rebellious against the Lord. Their rebellion against God brought the wrath of God down on them. They provoked God to wrath in the wilderness. I mean, you think about all the things that happened. A lot of people died out in the wilderness, um, you know, when, uh, when they were coveting food and he brought the quails. And then, uh, and then it says a lot of people died um, after that. And like the fattest of them died, it says. And then um, there's, there's so many different situations. I mean, God brought all kinds of different things. He brought a fire through the camp. There, all kinds of judgments came upon the people that were not pleasant, not good judgments, because they provoked God, because they had a rebellious heart. Now, turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 21. We're going to see under Moses' law how a rebellious son is dealt with. In Deuteronomy 21, we're almost done. This will be the last place I have you turn, Deuteronomy 21, because the Bible gave a law on how to deal with a rebellious son. And this is from God's mind. This is what God had for us. This is what God ordained as a punishment. So if God felt this way to have this type of a punishment, this type of, of law regarding a rebellious son physically in this earth, just keep this in mind when we read this. How do you think he's going to feel about you as a spiritual son of God with him being the father? Because I don't think there's going to be any, I don't think he's going to think about it differently. Look at verse number 8 of Deuteronomy 21. It says, If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him, will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out unto the elders of his city and unto the gate of his place, and they shall say unto the elders of his city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put evil away from among you. And all Israel shall hear and fear. God put the death penalty on a stubborn and rebellious son. Now, was it just an instant judgment? No. This is something that they've had opportunities to change and get right and to do what's right. It says they've been chastened. You know, they've been disciplined. They're not listening to us. He's just being completely stubborn. He knows he's not hearkening unto us. God's judgment was stone him with stones. That was his judgment for a son that's being rebellious to his parents. It's not listening to him. It's not obeying him. It's not respecting him. Not receiving discipline. Not receiving chastening. See, when you start sinning, God's going to chasten with you, chasten you. He's going to discipline you. He's going to bring some kind of judgment upon you because he loves you and he's trying to teach you and trying to show you, hey, look, I want you to get right with me and you know, he'll bring that chastening and that discipline. But if you don't receive that correction from God, it's not going to go well with you. And there have been many examples in the Bible where God just says, he just extinguishes their life, just, just, just wipes them out. Think of Nadab and Abihu. They offered up strange incense unto God. They have been commanded and told, you do not bring a strange incense unto me. You do not do this. They knew that law. They knew it. They can't say they didn't know it. That was, that was given to them. That was told specifically, this is what I want you to do. They came and brought strange incense anyways. God took them out. It's, it's a dangerous place to be when you start having a stiff neck towards God's laws and God, and you hear the preaching, you see it in God's word, but you just you just don't want to have anything to do with it, and, and you start hardening your heart and, and just, just doing what you want to do. And it's a rotten attitude, and it's going to end up driving you away from God. Because what it's in a, in a, usually I've seen this happen so many times. In the years that I've been in church, someone will start backsliding, and there'll be some specific sin that's in their life. And usually, I mean, you don't even have to know what it is, right? Whatever. Someone starts getting into some sin. 
And instead of getting right with God, you know, they'll, they'll probably hear about it being preached. They'll hear about it from the pulpit. And it's not even that anyone even knows. Usually it's something that nobody knows about, right? They have some sin in their life. They hear about it, but they don't want to change. They don't want to do what's right. That rebellious heart starts driving a wedge between them and God. That attitude, again, and, and, and that's why when, when people have that type of resistance, when people have that type of an attitude and say, you know what, I hear, I see what God's word says, but I don't care, I'm going to do what I want to do anyways. That's oftentimes you'll see people just, they fall out of church and they never come back. Or they, you know, they're out here for an extended period of time. They're out for a long time because they don't want to hear it. When you start with one thing, it starts to snowball. You, you still want to hear other things. Because you have this rebellious, stiff-necked attitude. And then your sins are just going to compound and get worse from there. It's the worst thing you can do. I mean, why hold on to that one thing? Just let it go. Let it go. If, I mean, if there's something that you do and you really like it, you say, no, it's a sin, just get rid of it. Because it's, it's just going to hurt you in the long run to try to hold on to that one thing that you think is just you, just, you have to keep doing it. Because it feels good or whatever, whatever the case may be. See, I believe it all starts in your heart. You have some sin, like I said, you just want to do it so bad. It becomes idolatrous. Because you end up putting that sin above serving God and above obeying Him and doing, and, and um, you end up just sinning willfully before God. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, you have to turn there. It says, let us hear the conclusion. At the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, it says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. That's it. Fear him, keep his commandments. It says, For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. The secret things, the things you don't know about, with ignorance, whatever. Things that no one else knows about, God knows them. God sees every single thing. He says, Whether it be good or whether it be evil, every work is going to be brought into judgment. Okay? We need to keep that in mind. Have the right attitude, have the right heart, be willing to accept the Bible just for what it says and for what it is. And, and if you see something in the Bible, hey, maybe you never saw it before. Right? You can say, I didn't, I didn't know that. Go to God and say, God, I didn't know that. I'm sorry. And be done with it. That's the attitude that we ought to have. And this is, again, maybe I preach on something that, that you're guilty of or whatever. Maybe I didn't. I don't know. But don't get angry. Don't get mad at the preacher. Look, if you're getting angry, anyone get mad at God. I mean, unless, I, unless I've just preached lies and heresy. Okay, if I preach lies and heresy, then go ahead and get mad at me. I don't think I did. I was pretty much reading what the Bible's saying. Okay? And, and you can take it for what it is, or you can leave it. But that's going to be between you and God. And I, I'm telling you right now, sinning through ignorance is one thing. Don't let it become sinning willfully. Don't have that type of attitude. It's going to destroy you. Let's borrow our time a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, um, not always the most pleasant of sermons to preach, dear God, but I, I pray that you would please help us all to take warning from your word, from your laws. Dear God, I thank you for giving us your laws. Your laws are perfect. They're just. They're right. God, um, help us to, to apply your laws to our lives um, that we would not be sinning through ignorance. Help us to learn your words. Help us to learn your laws and keep them in our hearts so that we can, we can go through and improve our lives to not be sinning willfully and to just um, be able to be pleasing in your sight. God, extend mercy unto us, especially when we sin through ignorance, dear Lord, and we come to you with a, with a humble spirit. God, please show, extend your mercy, your gracious, long-suffering, Lord. Um, we know that you're a God of mercies, and a God of love, and, and we thank you so much for that, dear Lord, that we don't even, it seems like we don't even reap the, the half of what we deserve, especially after we get saved, dear Lord. Um, and I thank you so much for being such a loving God, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.